like almost like we're here in the Americas and the Caribbean or in England or, or, or scattered around the world outside of our promised land and so there's a lot of people who say they be a Christian so forth and so on bring their interpretation so forth and so on but now when the people return they had to be um, debriefed you understand because many of them were disorientated so they had to be debriefed now what you're seeing on the screen right here is a short form of higher you understand going from the Hebrew again is the Jesenius um, Jesenius's uh, lexicon that we're referring to right there and we want to point out a couple of the meanings here as we scroll let's scroll through it you understand where you see force forces a host and it speaks about the in the Hebrew and where it's found now if you notice the first one which says forces or host let's read that one together all right in the Hebrew it's saying Shah ha hayil Shah ha hayil Shah ha hayil and it means leader of the army the Sher or the Shar or the some will say Sar actually if you go to the pointing of the dots in saying Shah ha hayil is the leader of the army you understand the Sar you was in 2 Samuel 24 and 2 and it speaks about soldiers you understand soldiers to give you the verses there now there's a quote from the psalm 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 110 and 3. you go to that quote right there something should be on the screen right now in the day of thy warfare it's a very important and it's considered to be one of the messianic psalms and it's one of the psalms that on the day that Hylas Elias the first of Ethiopia was anointed by the Tzadok and Kahinat that this psalm was one of the psalms chanted Psalm 110 where it has a key phrase there where it says in the day of thy warfare and then in the Hebrew it says the young hey hey leka hey hey leka the or hey leka beyond in the day of hey leka or hey leka of your heil and it goes on to say thy warlike expedition that is the day of the sending of the rod of Messiah's strength out of Zion. You see, a lot of people talk about his imperial majesty. He he was a coward. He was this and that. He left. He went to England in exile and was a British. They, they're coming from a worldly point of view. You understand? If you come from a scriptural point of view and recognize now what this psalm is saying in the Hebrew, what the reference is, the relation with the name Haile Selassie or Haile Selassie, and then this particular psalm being also invoked and spoken and chanted on the day of the anointing, and the anointing is the Messiahship upon the true king of Israel, the true king of kings of Ethiopia, says this psalm is referring to the day, and we know that day was May 5th. So we know there's a May 5th now linked to it. May 5th was that day. He left on May 5th and returned five years to the very day on May 5th. So this is now referring to the day of the sending of the, of the rod of Messiah's strength out of Zion. Now we know that Zion, Sion, is the city of David. It's, it's, it's where the Davidic family planted themselves and got their roots and is metaphorically related to the household of David or the king's line of Yehuda. So the sending of the Messiah's rod or the rod of the Messiah's strength out of Sion when he rules in the midst of his enemies. So when his imperial majesty went to Bath, England, if you know anything historically about Bath, and Bath was one of the capitals of Julius Caesar before he became emperor. You understand? And it has a very much a Romanesque relationship. It used to be the ancient capital of Rome at one time and of Julius Caesar. That his imperial majesty went to Bath, England because that's where he ruled in the midst of his enemies, the same British, so forth and so on, he recognized they were his enemies. He recognized what they had already done to undermine, you understand, his kingship like the Philistines did to great King David, you understand, right after he also was coronated and assumed the full authority of the Davidic, of the holy government, of God's government on earth. And what does it say right here? He strikes through kings in the day of his wrath. Remember his imperial majesty going to the League of Nations, he told them that the match was struck. The match had been struck in Ethiopia, but the flames would burn Europe. 
and so you'll see them be talking about like the whole appeasement and stuff like that but there was one particular individual who was saying um i forgot the guy who they said the one said we got peace in our time so forth and so on and they really believe that oh what his majesty his imperial majesty said it wasn't going to come to pass and sure enough world war ii came to pass and what immediately did many people who had witnessed and remembered his imperial majesty touching the conscience of the world, the little remaining conscience that wasn't burnt out, they recognized what his imperial majesty said was true, but they did not have the spiritual strength, you understand, to really respond to it. So they allowed it to happen, and now in the day when the rod of the messiahs of the anointed strength came out of Sion, out of Addis Ababa, out of Ethiopia, and went to rule in Bath, England, is where we get the prophetic Psalm 110.3 being fulfilled. And the striking through the kings in the day of, of his wrath is very important too, because Europe was being ruled by kings. You see, different places in Europe had kings that were ruling over them. They were called Christian monarchies, so forth and so on. But then if you notice, after World War II, all that would, would, was to change. That was no more. Yovas and the only really ancient kings in the world, really, you understand, was the king of kings of Ethiopia, was our ancient, um, we could say, esau I. Some say Esau is where the majority of that of that ruling relation comes to Japanese and the Asians, so forth and so on. But could you have to remember the Edomites, they had uh, dukes long before, yeah, the very ancient kingdom. So in China and in the Far East, you see that. But it was the king of Japan, Yovas, as well as the king of kings of Ethiopia. And then for the first time in a long time, England didn't have a king anymore, but they had a queen, Elizabeth II. You see what I'm saying? So the whole world picture was changed around that time. And we see clearly from scripture the relation of that prophecy is facts. I mean, these are facts. You can all research the facts of what his imperial majesty actually said, the prophetic portion of the of the prophecy. When his imperial majesty left Ethiopia, he went to Jerusalem, Jerusalem to pray in Hebrew. That he went to rule in the midst of his enemies, the same European powers that appeased Adolf Hitler and thought that well they had peace and safety and, and nothing could have been further from the truth. So we see there's a relation with that where it says beyond Heleka. Beyond Heleka. Beyond Heleka that in the day of thy warfare. It's very now some would translate that as a day of thy power. You see, they translate as power. So if they translate um Heleka, you understand? Or Heilika as power, isn't that a direct relation to the Ethiopic, to the royal Amharic? So when people say that that Amharic and the name of Haile Selassie is not Hebrew, and there's teachers and scholars and so forth and so on, well, you know what level of study they're on because they have not made that relation. You see, because they're trying to avoid the truth. But the truth, you understand, is the truth, and ones will know the truth, and the truth is what will set them free from these lies. Now you see that Haile Selassie, at least the first part, because in this we're going to touch on the first part, and then we're going to touch on Selassie in the Bible. You understand that if you could read the Hebrew and study the Hebrew, even with the Jewish rabbinical pointings, you can still see the relation of the letters, the words, what they mean in interpretation, and becomes much more clearer for you. So now what you're looking at is some of the other the relations of the word Hayu, which means uh, in relation to ability, like in the ability to get wealth. I mean that verse from Deuteronomy 8 and 18, 17 and 18, that he is the one who gives us that power, that Hayu, to get wealth. You see why the Ethiopia become a poor nation. They blamed it on his imperial majesty, but that is classic to do because they did it with the Moshia. So when Christ now speaks about the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed. Why he said that there'll be many ones calling themselves Christ, but there'll be false Christ because there are certain scriptural biblical qualifications. This is why even when Christ said to his disciples, who do people say I am and who do you say I am? And then they told him, then Simon Peter told him that you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God, of the of of the of the Hiao, of the high, you understand? Elohim of the living God. He, he told them and charged them, don't tell anybody this. 
You see what I'm saying? Because he already knew that Satan had a target for the Messiah. You know what I'm saying? There's a target for the Messiah, the true Messiah. If it's his Messiah, he allowed them to go and deceive people. You know what I'm saying? But there's a target for the true Messiah. Now, when you also touch on this word, Hayel, you know what I'm saying? You see that the fourth definition of it is virtue, uprightness, integrity, also fitness, that men are of capacity. You, that's used also for a virtuous woman. She has Hayel, she has strength. Also used for an honest or an upright man. You see that last verse right there? The last verse is the same name in the Hebrew. Get a, get a close up on the Hebrew. Can you get a close up on it? The, right there. Bain ha yil, bain ha yil, bain ha yil, and next in the English is almost like we're here in the Americas.